We are in a moment of time where we can aim for elimination, but we'll only do that if we get the treatments out, and we will only do that if we understand our epidemics globally and make sure that we treat where treatment is necessary, not just to stop people from dying, which is incredibly important, but I won't be speaking about that today, but making sure that we treat where transmission is occurring. And I was asked to speak about enhancing prevention, care and treatment among people who inject drugs. Not every country, this is where the driver of transmission is, but in many developed countries and in some areas of developing countries, it's an issue. So, so I think it's, first of all, what I'd be saying is in the broad context, know your epidemic and then work on prevention in your epidemic of stopping transmission. And in many countries, that's to do with how do we actually treat people who inject drugs. Oops, it is. Okay, just for disclosures, I um, receive funding from, or well, my institute does from Gilead Science, AbbVie and BMS for investigator-initiated projects. Okay, am I doing this wrong? Is it the central mouse or? Yeah, that one. Yep. Okay, also acknowledgements in particular, I'd like to acknowledge a few people from the Burnett Institute, um, from the Alfred Hospital and St Vincent's Hospital where we collaborate very closely on this work. So uh, many other people to acknowledge at the end. Today I'm just going to give a brief overview of the epidemiology of hepatitis C, talk about the WHO elimination targets which many countries are now taking up, the importance of treating people who inject drugs to achieve elimination if that's the driver of your epidemic, the importance of a multi-pronged approach to elimination and other things needed to achieve elimination. So as you all well know, hepatitis C occurs globally and with many, many people infected. The numbers vary slightly depending on the modelling that is being done at a particular time, but the estimate is around 70 million people globally at the moment are infected with hepatitis C. And why do we care about hepatitis C? Because it causes deaths. And the number of deaths due to hepatitis C is increasing and increasing and is increasing along with hepatitis B. Whereas in some of the other major killers of, of people related to infection, they've been going down. Globally, as well, injecting drug use happens. Now, many people in this audience would be going, well, should I care about injecting drug use? What's the problem with injecting drug use? But we need to think of it as a health problem rather than a legal problem. It occurs globally and there's many, many countries. There's not really a country in the world where you're doing good counting that it is not happening. And people who inject drugs are at particular risk of hepatitis C. They're also at risk of other bloodborne viruses, but many, many are at risk of hepatitis C. Invariably, the prevalence is higher amongst men than women, and that's related to who injects drugs. And in some countries, Georgia, Soviet Union, well, the old areas of the old Soviet Union, but in particular Russia, very high proportions of people who inject drugs, and very high proportions of people hepatitis C in those countries, and in fact, in countries like in Russia and Georgia, where the prevalence among people who inject drugs is extraordinarily high. So where we have hepatitis C, where we have people who inject drugs, they will always be together. But can we eliminate it? There is enormous optimism, basically because we have cure. We have safer, simpler, and more effective drugs, as this audience well knows. And they've just, it's been extraordinary the last few years. Along with those drugs, though, you have to say, well, what can we do about them? We can stop people from dying. But also, if you look at the sustainable development goals from 2015, it was that we were going to end the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and combat hepatitis. We would have liked it to have been ending the epidemics of, but we thought combat will be close enough. And as well, though, those sustainable development goals means universal co health coverage, and that's a really important issue. It doesn't mean just treating people that we think look like us. And WHO, in response to those sustainable development goals and instructions from the world, sort of, uh, the, the, uh, the global sort of push, was that basically a world where viral hepatitis transmission is stopped and everyone living with hepatitis has access to safe and affordable treatment and essentially aim to eliminate viral hepatitis as a major public health threat by 2030. Some people think these goals are ridiculous and pie in the sky. Um, as a person that had the um, good fortune of being in the room when the modelling was being discussed and we were looking to set the targets, I actually think they're really achievable. Um, they're ambitious, I have no doubt that they're not ambitious, but I do believe they're achievable if we decide that this is something that we want to do. With 
Hepatitis B, which I'm not speaking about today, we have a fabulous vaccine and we have diseases that can stop people from dying. There is no reason why we should not, if we really work hard, plus if we can get cure, really get a handle on hepatitis B. With hepatitis C, we don't have a vaccine, and I still think we need a vaccine. It's again not my um, talk today, but the importance of a vaccine shouldn't be underestimated, but we have cure and we have ways to prevent transmission. And so this is an achievable goal. But to achieve it, we have to diagnose people with the disease, which means that people have to be aware that the disease exists. We have to treat those who are eligible for treatment. And that is much harder than we might think. As well, we must have prevention and harm reduction, a really important thing that should never, ever be underestimated. There is no point in treating somebody for hepatitis C if you're not going to either improve your health system structures, again, not the talk today, or to provide clean needles and syringes uh, for the people who are at risk of getting high hepatitis C and the risk of reinfection. So why is it important to treat people who inject drugs? Well, really nice modelling by Natasha Martin and Peter Vickerman from the Bristol group showed us something that, and this was the first model that made sense to me and I think a lot of people, that you didn't need to treat everybody immediately who injects drugs to go, actually, we can begin to eliminate. You only needed to, 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 depending on the background prevalence in your population, treat 5, 10, 20, 40 people who inject drugs per 1,000 people who inject drugs to significantly reduce the prevalence. And this modelling was done initially in the pre-DAA era. We, that model was extended to look at a number of cities, including data, because we had data from Melbourne in Australia at the time, to say what would happen if we could extend this and do better with the new drugs. And this was when we were doing the cost of the drugs being 50,000 US dollars a course. Now, as many of you know, whilst in the US some people are still paying large amounts of dollars for that, around the world the price of drugs is, is falling. So it was even cost effective to begin to eliminate back when the price of drugs was expensive. This seems to not want to move on me, Wilco. Ah, thank you. As well, so we can begin to eliminate, and it's cost effective, highly cost effective. As well, in Melbourne, we were looking at what's the role of the injecting network. Nobody injects drugs on their own. They invariably inject drugs with other people. That's how you actually get the virus. So we looked at the role of the injecting network and said, can we impose on the injecting network to get a better bang for our buck with these treatments? But also, will that stop the risk of reinfection, and will this be the most easiest way, actually, to bring in people who inject. And what we were able to show is that we would, could significantly even get better bang for our buck if we didn't just treat the individual, but also treated their injecting partners. So we had really nice models showing us that even with um, sort of treatment outcomes of around 80%, we could get substantial reductions in hepatitis C incidence and prevalence. In Australia, we then said, well, what do we actually need to do in Australia to get this job done? We want to make sure that nobody dies of the disease, so how do we make sure we treat people with severe disease? But as well, if we want to actually stop transmission, we cannot just simply have treatment available for stage three or four disease in terms of fibrosis. We must treat people who inject. And what we were able to show is that we could be treating say 5,000 to 6,000 people with significant liver disease for the first five years or so, but as well if we only treated as few as really around 5,000 people who injected drugs annually in Australia, we could stop deaths related to hepatitis C and we could stop transmission related to hepatitis C to get those prevention and prevalence numbers down to reach the WHO targets. But you had to do both. You can't do one or the other, but there's no reason not to do both. And then it gets back to the importance of data. You have to know, have some idea of your numbers to know what the job entails and whether you're making progress. So in Australia, and I'll use Australia's example because I've got you know, much better handle on the figures, around 220,000 people in 2015 were thought to be living with chronic hepatitis C, of which some of those, also we had 93,000 people who inject drugs, an estimate. About half of those are thought to be infected. As well, we have people in prison Many of those have a history of drug use, recent drug use, and a history of also um, hepatitis C infection. And well, as well, you have people on opiate substitution therapy. It's important to understand if somebody's on opiate substitution therapy, they may still be injecting drugs. They may have previously been infected with hepatitis C. They may be in prison. They may overlap. 
But what this does is tells you where this job needs to get done. It can get done in prisons, it can get done at clinics to do with opiate substitution therapy, or it also, though, needs to get done outside of those environments, just in the community generally treating people who inject drugs. And the thing is, people who inject drugs respond well to treatment. The trials pre, and I did a, lot of, did a number of reviews and worked with people pre direct acting antivirals showed that even in the pegylated interferon and ribavirin days, the response to treatment of people who injected drugs was equivalent to people who did not inject drugs. And work by a number of other people, including Greg Dorr and Jason Grebelly at the Kirby and, and, and collaborations globally, of which I've had the good fortune to be involved, has clearly shown that there's good outcomes to do with being on OST and not OST, so a number of different studies now. As an important study was the CoStar study, which showed this, and also the Simplify study, which is really showing this. So what we can see is treatment outcomes, to me, it's not to be unexpected. People who inject drugs are really good at taking drugs. And if you give them the opportunity to take their tablets, and that's the issue, is they will take them. So I think that's one of the things that we constantly underestimate, is that we have this strange vision of who we're talking about as if they're other than us. But in fact, many of them are very, very similar to us, got the same ambitions for their lives, all sorts of things. Life has meant that along the way, they may have been involved in injecting drug use, but they still don't want to have a chronic viral disease that would lead their, to their death. They want, and they don't want to transmit it to their family. They don't want to transmit it to their partner. So if they're given the opportunity of treatment, they take it. And when you look at data from the former, sort of what I'll call real world data as well, in terms of a series of now studies that are coming out, again, people who inject drugs are doing very well in terms of treatment outcomes. People say, well, what about reinfection? You know, like we're just going to treat them and they're going to get themselves reinfected again and again and again. And the first thing to say about it is, yes, some of them will. And if you're not seeing reinfection, I would argue you're not actually treating the right population. Because if you're not seeing reinfection, then you're not treating a person who's currently injecting drugs. The second thing I would say to you is, did you give them a lesson in safe injecting? And when they left your room, after you'd treated them, did you give them a box of clean needles and syringes and say, now, would you mind using these and would you mind actually handing them over to the people you inject with? And when they were leaving your room, did you actually ask them, or even before they left your room, but just as they were starting their treatment, who do you inject with? Would you like to bring them in, please? Maybe I'll treat them at the same time. Treat their partners, treat their friends. So I think we've got to be really careful about when we say we don't like the idea of reinfection as to whether we're contributing to reinfection by just saying we don't like it. Think of all of the other diseases in the community where we would never not treat again. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Sporting injuries. We don't tell a sportsman, stop doing those kind of things because you're going to need your knee replaced and then another knee replaced and you're going to have arthritis at the end. It's often our prejudgments of behaviour, self-induced behaviour, that we think this group shouldn't get it. So we need to remind ourselves, what are we doing to make a contribution to stop reinfection? Despite the evidence that people who inject drugs can be treated, despite the evidence that reinfection occurs, but not at a particularly high level, but why not treat? And despite the evidence that we need to treat people who inject drugs if we want to actually eliminate the epidemic, unfortunately, we still have, in some jurisdictions, barriers. And a lot of them actually are not evidence-based. They are reactions to do with long-term stereotypes and pressures. It's to do with many things, but it's certainly not to do with scientific evidence as to why we're not treating people who inject drugs. Similarly in Europe, so the United States, it's very ad hoc. Similarly in Europe, lots and lots of different rules. In Australia, we had the good fortune to be able to, I think, convince our government, community-based organisations, we had evidence models, scientists, uh, researchers, clinicians, all working together to try and convince the government that a broad access would be a good idea. And so in March in 2016, essentially, we had no restrictions on the disease stage no restrictions on drug or alcohol use in terms of if somebody was using them. The prescription was by specialists, and importantly, and I'll speak to this in a moment, other doctors, and treatment was available in our prison system. So essentially, the idea was to treat as many as possible as fast as possible. They did a really great deal in negotiating a price that meant that we didn't have to sort of spend an enormous amount over the five years, and in fact, the, far, the more we treat, the cheaper it is for us, so our job is to treat a lot. Similarly, two other countries around the world, there are a couple of other countries around the world besides these two aiming for elimination, but this is where um, an epidemic is being strongly driven by people who inject drugs, is Georgia and Iceland, 
where essentially, again, a government commitment to elimination was made, and then they have been supported in achieving that, and Gilead has made significant contributions in terms of drugs to both of these countries, but when you talk to people, it was because their governments decided they were going for elimination that that's why the support came. And it's been extraordinary. I've just literally flown from the Georgian... I'm on the Georgian Technical Advisory Group for, for Hepatitis C Elimination in Georgia, and they're doing a remarkable job. But they're still going to have issues. So they've screened 1.2 million, so nearly 775,000 unique individuals, nothing like what they're up to in, in Egypt, but that's not an epidemic driven by people who inject drugs, so I won't speak about that today, Manal, but I just acknowledge it. Um, Iceland, the same. They nearly got the job done. I provide some advice to Iceland. They don't have as many. It's like a nice sort of small pilot. But the thing that you'll see here is that despite this, we're still not getting enough people cured. And that's an issue in Georgia, and I'll talk about it being an issue in Australia as well. Now, a major hurdle has been the initial price of these treatments, that the $1,000 a day, nobody hardly ever paid $1,000 a day. But it set the conversation, in my view, in the wrong place. Because what it meant is that many governments then balked at the idea of what treatment and elimination might cost them and might mean. And importantly, compared to what happened in HIV, and as a person that sort of worked through the HIV era as an infectious diseases physician, of where we worked to get the prices of drugs down so that in Africa you could stop the deaths, this has happened remarkably much faster in hepatitis C. And in fact, the price of drugs has dropped substantially. And now in Pakistan, you can treat somebody for about 84 US dollars a cure, and it's likely to get less. In Australia, it's around, depending on how many we treat, six to 10,000. So it's no longer just going to be the price of drugs. Yes, in some countries, the price of drugs at the moment is prohibitive, but that will change over the next few years, in my view. What we then have to say is, what comes after that. So we need to get those prices down for all jurisdictions, high income, middle income and low income countries, but we need to think about it's more than just treatment alone. There's a cascade of care that we need to think about. This is work done by Jason Grebley and others at the Kirby Institute in terms of that cascade of care of saying it's just, number one, you've got the drugs, but you've got to actually diagnose people, make sure you've got their RNA, get them onto treatment, assess them. And what we can see in Australia with prescribing data is that we started off with a bang, the waterfall effect. And as you can see, it's already dropping off in Australia as to the number of people that we're treating every quarter. And so at the rate we're going, we're going to be treating rather than the $35,000 in the, the 35,000 people in that first year, it's going to be down to around 20 to 25. Now, what does that mean for us? Because it doesn't, so it certainly doesn't mean we've cured everybody of hepatitis C, because as I remind you, there were 220,000 people to start with. What we can see is, pleasingly, that amongst people who inject drugs, this is data from the annual needle and syringe program survey that's done by Lisa Marks' group in Sydney, with, um, and, and essentially that we're treating some of the right people. And I'll remind you that's what we need to do. But as you can see, if you look at the sums, we started off not treating many people who injected drugs. But every year we get about six to 10,000 new people. So in that first year, we managed to treat a lot of people. About 8,500 were estimated to be people who injected drugs when we treated 35,000 people in total. Now, the important thing is, and I'll remind you that when I said our model suggested we needed to treat around 5,000 a year, if you look at when we've dropped down this year to treating around 22 to 24,000 people, we're just on that 5,000 mark for people who inject drugs if the take-up remains the same. So even in a country where we have broad access to treatment, that we have treatment in prisons, that we have no cost or virtually no cost for testing, no cost for treatment of the person, we're going to struggle to reach our targets if we don't really think hard about how we're going to do this. And that we will not get down to where we want to be. This is modelling by Nick Scott from my group, which essentially says, if we stay at those high-level targets, we'll be OK. But if we drop any further, we will not make it by 2030. So it needs a multi-pronged approach. To remind you all, and I don't think this audience needs reminding, but prevention is vitally important. And prevention when it comes to people who inject drugs means harm reduction, which is needles and syringes and opiate substitution therapy. There is Clear evidence with modelling by Natasha Martin and Peter Vickerman again in that group 
that there's a real benefit from it and that actually we will not achieve our elimination targets successfully without it. But what we know is that globally there are many, many countries that do not have access to needle and syringe programs and many, many countries that do not have access to opiate substitution therapy, Russia being one, one of the highest prevalences of hepatitis C globally amongst people who inject drugs, high levels of injecting and no OST. It's um, likely to be a disaster. So what we need is to have more people up in that top right corner of high coverage of needle syringe programs and high levels of OST if we're going to achieve elimination. As well, we need to increase testing. And in fact, I was at a meeting just recently where the discussion was really around the fact that the test of hepatitis C RNA, the RNA test, is going to actually cost more than the treatment. And in low-income countries, if your test costs more than your treatment, it's not going to happen. So one of the biggest areas where we need significant work is to ensure that we have get low-cost testing. And that can be rapid point-of-care tests, that can be tests that then go to sort of, you know, run it at laboratories. It depends on the system that's required, but the reality is we're not going to make it unless we markedly upscale testing, and we're not going to make it unless the cost of testing comes down markedly. So something that needs an enormous amount of work going on. And that's not just for hepatitis C, that's for hepatitis B, that's for HIV, this is for tuberculosis, for many, many things globally where we want to have elimination programs. We are not going to achieve our goals unless we have that test come down. Again, work by Nick Scott in my group has clearly shown that unless we upscale testing in Australia, but this is also, we've looked at this globally, unless we markedly upscale, and then number one, we're offering tests where you quickly go onto the RNA test, you've had the antibody, then go onto the RNA test, as well as having regular testing, we will not hitch, reach the elimination targets. We've just done some work recently where we essentially had a needle and syringe program and, and Jason Grebley and others, in, again, in, in the Kirby have done similar work where we've essentially had people come in where they get their needles and syringes, a one-stop shop for people who inject drugs. We did a rapid oral test. We then, if that was positive, said, let's get some blood taken. And then we did a rapid point of care test with a Cepheid machine. Interestingly for us, people liked the oral test. They didn't wait around for the Cepheid result 90 minutes or two hours was too long for them. But in some countries, this will work. But what we've got to be doing is really collecting evidence about what's the best way to get people in for testing, whether it's birth cohorts, whether it's key populations. It doesn't matter what it is. We've got to work out a way to engage people and then maintain them in care to get onto that RNA test. As well, in terms of thinking about treatment models, no one model best fits all. The key model I know won't work is if we expect people always to come to us. And if you think about why, it's pretty simple. Most of us sit in large tertiary hospitals um, waiting and providing fabulous services. But if you think about people who inject drugs, many of them may not be working, or if they're working, which is a number of many, will be, they're often not in jobs where you get sick leave to take the day off. So to ask them to come to see us means that you're asking them to take a day off where they're not getting paid. You're also asking them often to come to a clinic in the morning and then you're wondering why they're turning up late and that's because to get their opiate substitution therapy they had to go to the chemist in the morning to pick it up and wait in a long queue or whatever it might be. So you're wondering why they didn't turn up at 9 o'clock and I'm wondering why we made a 9 o'clock appointment. To pay for the car park to pay for the public transport, to pay for a number of these things is a significant cost to their income relative to our income. And then we want them to come back time and time and time and time again because, in fact, most of us won't start them on treatment immediately. We want to get some drug, uh, bloods. We want them to come back and get the results of those bloods. We will take some more bloods. We will want them to get the results of those bloods and then maybe we'll book them in for a fibrous scan and then maybe about four visits in, we may or may not choose to treat them if they turn up to each of those visits. And if they don't turn up to each of those visits, we'll call them unreliable. And I would just ask, don't ask you to put up your hands, but I'll just ask you how many of you guys have done a timely fasting blood that you've been asked to by your doctor, hit all of your dental appointments on time, done all of those things. And yet we have an unreasonable expectation that this group of people who often have much less money than us, who have many things going on in their lives, are gonna be able to turn up to our service for five or six appointments before we might choose to treat them. So our service should not be where we are, our service should be where they are. 
For us, that might be in a van with nurses who are doing bloods and testing and fibre scans and offering treatment. That might be in a community clinic. It might be to do with telehealth. It might be anywhere where they are where we need to go and look for them. Because if we want to eliminate something as a public health threat, that's our responsibility. So the TAP study is a study we're doing in Melbourne, which is a treatment and prevention study where we treat the person who injects drugs and we treat their injecting partner. This is supported, um, investigated, initiated grant with funding from Gilead. And essentially we're looking at that treat your friends approach and seeing whether or not treating people who inject drugs does reduce the incidence and prevalence of hepatitis C in our populations. As well, Sanjeev Arora has done an initial study of, in Project ECHO where he showed that essentially um, telehealth but also building capacity in communities was a really effective way of treating people for hepatitis C. And this is now expanded to many places globally in terms of, of the, the impact of, of his work. So, so again, what we can see is the patient who could not get to his hospital did just as well when they did telehealth out into the community. A study we're doing at the moment called the PRIME study, which is a randomised control trial um, looking at models of care. So we have community-based clinics where it's that one-stop shop for people who inject drugs. It's a nurse-led model of care. Essentially, the nurses do all the work up when they first see the person. They take all the bloods. They organise everything. Then the person either gets randomised to have their treatment at the service where they are or gets sent up to the large tertiary hospital. This study has been, um, it's an investigator initiated grant and supported by AbbVie, should acknowledge that. And in essence, the study's not over, so this is the first 120 patients. But what we're clearly seeing is that treatment outcomes in the groups are the same, the SVR is the same. But if you look at the numbers getting up, so that stay at the clinic to get on treatment, it's over 70%. And if you look at the proportion of people that get up to the tertiary hospital, it's only around 35 to 40%. So just offering treatment here, rather than say you go there, doubles the number of people that we get onto treatment. So these things are really important when we're thinking about what are we going to do in that elimination attempt. Similarly, John Dillon in, um, in Tayside up in Scotland is doing work in terms of the dot C and in essence he's a, trying to eliminate from his area in Scotland and um, he doesn't mind where you get treated. In the UK, a pharmacist is allowed to prescribe hepatitis C treatment within strict guideline rules. So if somebody goes in for their OST, the pharmacist might prescribe. If somebody's in the community, the nurse might prescribe. It's in essence where they are, where a person is, is where treatment will be offered with no expectation that this person will necessarily see a doctor at all. Similarly, the TAP study, that treatment in the van, that person, that those patients will never see a doctor. They have a paper check with a doctor, but they don't actually get to see the doctor. There's no need. As well, in Australia and in a number of countries, massively upscaling, and, and you'll see from, I mentioned previously, a significant proportion of people who inject drugs are incarcerated because we seem to think that that might stop injecting. It's never, no evidence. In fact, the evidence is quite opposite but because we don't take, in terms of correctional settings, a evidence-based response to these things. Um, we incarcerate a lot of people with mental health problems and drug and alcohol problems in our prisons, both in Australia but globally. Um, but it's a perfect place to treat people for hepatitis C. Again, Andrew Lloyd and Alex Thompson in Sydney and in Melbourne run nurse-led models of care. Again, unless the person has significant liver disease, stage four liver disease, they may never ever see a doctor. Again, a paper check. And this is leading to large numbers of people being treated through this system. And, that's be and it's an important area because this is where people, they're being incarcerated because of injecting drug use, people who inject drugs. As well, you have HIV, HCV co-infection. In some jurisdictions around the world, this is predominantly in people who inject drugs, the Swiss, Swiss cohort, also in parts of Canada. In Australia, it's predominantly driven by men who have sex with men, but a number of those are also involved injecting. So as well, we have elimination studies going on. And again, the expectation that somebody's going to come up to the clinic, no, we go to where they are. Now, if you think about it, somebody who's got HIV, they have a regular visit with their GP, invariably to get bloods and to get their antiretroviral therapy. So there is no reason why that those GPs can be managing HIV. They certainly can manage hepatitis C treatment with a nurse-led model of care. Very simple, much 
um, more cost-effective and no expectations that somebody has double visits to doctors. So we've got a large Eliminate C partnership going on in our state and it involves Community Harm Reduction Victoria, who represent people who inject drugs, Hepatitis Victoria, the general community, the government, every health service in terms of primary care and the like. And the kind of things that you need to think about is, number one, and this is if you think about what the WHO and many will say, you've got to, number one, make sure people are aware that treatment is available. As much as we all know that there's cure available, many, many people don't, are not aware of cure. So you need to make sure that you raise community awareness. As well, many people who inject drugs think that we're not going to treat them. So you need to raise awareness that treatment is available. If you've got a jurisdiction where that's not happening, then that's a bit more of a problem. But in terms of if it's generally available, you need to raise awareness. You need to upskill people who are going to be offering treatment. This is, I always say, if a specialist is doing it, why can't a primary care doctor? If a primary care doctor is doing it, why can't a nurse? If a nurse is doing it, why can't that be a community worker? This is all pretty simple. So that's really an important thing. We need clinical support and coordination, so we need to say how do we help these services to be effective. We need to also have data systems to actually evaluate it, and we need to be monitoring and doing research for the things that we don't know. We need to get rid of every complicated thing that doesn't need to be there. You don't need to do a simple blood test. You can do, do a simple blood test. If you think about it, an FBE plus an LFT, Anna, you'll be pleased, and a pre. Very nice, very simple. And if the APRI is less than one, just treat the person. They do not have significant liver disease. If the APRI is greater than one, then think about doing a fibrous scan. If it's less than 12.5, treat them in community. If it's greater than 12.5, send them up to the hospitals. But in essence, this does not need to be complicated. Do everything to have somebody treated in community. As I said, in my view, a hepatitis C vaccine is vitally important. I don't think we're going to achieve elimination without it. In a country like Australia, we might, but we'll be one of the few countries that does. I think in many countries where they don't have significant harm reduction programs, really with high levels of... So I'd say sort of also at the, the Dutch will probably achieve it without a vaccine. There'll be a few countries. But in most countries where you don't have high levels of OST coverage and you don't have strong needle and syringe program coverage, then you are going to need a vaccine. We're going to need a vaccine. And it doesn't need to be a perfect vaccine. We've done modelling which clearly shows that a vaccine of around 50 to 60% efficacy will be highly effective in a public health response combined with curative treatments, combined with harm reduction in getting us to achieve those elimination targets. You also need, as I said, to have strong evaluation and surveillance to know whether you're getting the job done. And if the job's not being done how you think it should be, if you're not hitting your targets, then you know what to be doing about it. So that's a really important aspect of it. As well, we should never underestimate the issue of stigma and discrimination. The evidence is really clear that a public health approach to drug policy is really important, that this is highly effective. But yet we continue to spend 98% of dollars related to drugs by our governments on the war on drugs to prevent drugs from coming in. I'm not saying that drugs should be open slather, but it's been an absolute and dismal failure in every country where it's happening. And in countries like Portugal, where there's been decriminalisation of drugs, it's been highly effective with a reduction in drug use as opposed to an increase in drug use. We need to be looking at clear evidence if we're going to be successful here. We need to involve everybody, particularly the affected communities. And that's it from me. I'd like to acknowledge many, many people who have uh, helped me with slides and contributed to this work over the years, um, in particular folks from the Burnett Institute and St Vincent's and the Alfred, as I said, as well as others. I'd like to thank you the funders and let's aim for elimination. <laughs>